Erev Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. We have some definitely some flashpoints in the world today. In fact, earlier today I was on with Bonnie Harvey on Hebrew Nation Radio. You might want to check out our programs there. Uh, Flashpoint is the name of it. There it airs on Sundays and Wednesdays. I forget exactly the time that it airs, but uh, I'll have to get that information and share that with you guys. We always do things there that generally are never mentioned here on Israeli News Live. So you may want to follow that program we do there, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you. But anyway, let's get right into the broadcast this morning or this afternoon. U.S. ambassador to North Korea uh, will be destroyed. That was Nikki Haley uh, says warns reckless Pyongyang a whole lot of military options are being considered to defend U.S. and the allies, and military action military action is definitely on the table, uh, as is being pointed out here. It says the U.N. ambassador to the U.N. warned North Korea will be destroyed if it continues the reckless behavior and forces the United States and its allies to defend themselves against any attack. Now, I have to say, as much as I think that Kim Jong-un is really doing some pretty outlandish things out there, I'm not really sure if he's going to be the guy to pull the trigger first. It just doesn't look like it. It seems like that he keeps trying to flex his own muscle back to show the United States that uh, he is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, But at this point here, he doesn't really have enough support behind him to make that preemptive strike on his own. So I don't think that that'll actually happen. Could be wrong, but uh, if anything, maybe a false flag to kind of justify that. But, you know, with the United States preparing to use a, a military force against North Korea, and I do believe that that is almost inevitable, if you remember... President Putin, uh, his own country recently was stating that they did not believe that uh, nuclear weapons would be used or weapons of mass destruction would be used on the Korean Peninsula. I have wondered, in fact, I shared this with Bonnie today on our program Flashpoint, uh, that perhaps Russia is already aware that uh, the U.S. is going to do a preemptive strike on North Korea, and perhaps they did some kind of negotiation there to allow it so long as there were not weapons of mass destruction used on the Korean Peninsula. But nonetheless, here's another interesting thing that's happening. RT brings this out today, and that is the Joint C-2017 Russian and China to send 11 ships, two subs to the Pacific. Well, not just the Pacific, but to the Sea of Japan. Uh, interesting, isn't it, that Russia is sending in with the Chinese 11 ships. Now, they say two submarines. Well, maybe there's already a dozen or so already there. Don't really know the answer to that either, but I kind of think it's interesting that Russia and China are bringing in all this military power. At the same time, the U.S. has all their military power in the region. It is not going to go very well. And we already know that Russia is involved with the Zapad exercises. Uh, Now the Swedes are also doing the exercises simultaneously. Russia in their second week of these exercises going on over in Europe. And uh, believe it or not, the exercises actually began in Ukraine, not Belarus. I guess Russia is definitely flexing their own muscle to show that they are the power to be reckoned with in the region. But things get a little bit more tense. And I tell you what, friends, I don't even know what to call this video with all the tense situations that are happening. Pentagon was informed about area of Russia's military op in Deir Azort in advance, according to Moscow. Uh, what's going on here? In Deir Azort, we are finding out that the uh, U.S. coalition's trainers, along with some of the Kurds and the Free Syrian Army, got right in the middle of one of those cruise missiles that happened to be flying over from two submarines out in the Mediterranean. Seven cruise missiles were launched at the ISIS targets inside of Deir Azort, both eastern and western side of the river. Now, if you remember, U.S. generals were already saying that uh, it was a red line for the Syrian military to cross the Euphrates River at Deir Azort. Now, there was kind of a media blockout on that story as well. We reported it right along with a couple of other news agencies that were showing that the Free Syrian, excuse me, the Syrian Arab Army, Bashar al-Assad's forces, had in fact crossed the Euphrates River there in Deir Azort. Russia also in support of that, bombing those sites. Well, the Pentagon now has blamed Russia for attacking the Free Syrian Army as well as some of the coalition trainers. But 
Russia kind of had a very interesting response to this, and that was uh, from none other than uh, General uh, uh, Igor, I believe, I know that Igor, what's Igor's last name? Kanashkanov, I believe is his name there. He responded back, and I thought it was e very interesting. Yes, Igor uh, Kanashkanov, he says right up here, to avoid unnecessary escalation, the command of the Russian troops in Syria revealed the boundaries of the military operation at De Azor uh, to the American partners through existing communications channels. The Russian Defense Ministry said in a statement on Sunday, within the framework of this operation, the fighters, armored vehicles, and objects of terrorists are being destroyed on both western and eastern banks of the Euphrates. Now, this is what General Igor Konashkanov said. But then he made this other very bold statement right here. And let me kind of blow that up. I want you guys to really see his statement here because the U.S. was accusing them of not sharing the information that this was going to happen. So he says here, over the past few days on the eastern bank of the Euphrates, Russian control and reconnaissance facilities have not uh, identified a single combat of Islamic State terrorists within armed representatives of any third force. In other words, no free Syrian army, no Kurds, no U.S. coalition, right? Then he says, therefore, only representatives of the international coalition can answer the question as to how opposition members or military advisors of the international coalition managed to get to the ISIS-held areas in the eastern part of the Azor without striking a blow. In other words, without being bombed on the way by ISIS, unless perhaps maybe they're working with them. I think that's the point that uh, General Igor Konashkinov is trying to make right here. Uh, the chief of the Russian general staff, General Valery uh, Gersimov, has reportedly spent an hour on the phone discussing the matter with the U.S. counterpart, General Joseph Dunford. All right, yesterday a telephone conversation took place between the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the U.S. Armed Forces, Joseph Dunford, and the chief of the Russian general staff, General uh, uh, Valery uh, Gersimov. The key topic of the talks was the situation in Syria, in particular the incident in the Azor. Now, let me say something. I'm going to throw in a wild card on this particular issue here. Uh, Russia says they didn't, they did, they warned them, and the U.S. is saying that they didn't warn them. Russia is blaming the U.S. for being able to sneak past ISIS without encountering any blows. And I cannot help but wonder, because De Azor, as you remember last year, was a scene where the U.S. coalition was steadily bombing the Syrian army now, down near the airfield in De Azor. Uh, driving them back, killing 60-plus uh, Syrian army soldiers. But what was not reported in mainstream media that we share with you here on Israeli News Live was that what about a dozen Russian special operatives were in that region as well that were killed, all 12. At least there was probably more, but there were 12 that were actually killed. That was never brought out by the Russian side. Could it be that this is kind of like a uh, payback time? Maybe Russia just decided that, hey, you did this to us last year. Time to kind of pay the pauper for the piping that you did on us. Uh, I can't say for sure. Here's one of the uh, Syrian uh, MiGs there coming in, Russian language here, speaking about the same incident here on uh, Turgaro. I can't even pronounce that name, forget it. Live Journal was actually uh, bringing this out as well about the attack that happened. And uh, But here's another interesting thing that just came out as well. This is on, uh, I believe, already happened on their website as well as on their Twitter page there. A uh, what is it? 150, I believe, armored vehicles being brought in from Turkey into Syria. Wow! I guess these are being used for the Kurds there in order to be able to galvanize more land for themselves. 150 of these rascals. You think the U.S. is planning on backing down at all? Not a single bit in the world. And then people say that. Uh, well, Turkey did a coup and they blamed the U.S. These guys are working hand in hand. Let me show you where these things come from. It's, it's this place right here in Turkey here, way up there close to Bulgaria. I have a feeling that NATO made sure they supplied the, the needed uh, armored vehicles and Turkey was just kind enough to transport them across their borders. Hmm, interesting. I do believe that... Uh, uh, President Erdogan is in the, at the United Nations meeting there in the United States right now. And let's just hope his bodyguards don't beat up anybody while they're there. The journalists could get beat up while they're there, you know. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, this is another kind of an odd report that is coming out of Iraq today. I'll figure I'd just share it with you. There is a lot of false news going on about this story. Syria Frontlines reports this as well. U.S. war base photos 
This is at Mahmur, Iraq. It says that there were four uh, four ISIS militants that have actually at uh, attacked this particular U.S. military base. Some people are saying 40 people were killed in the uh, 40 U.S. soldiers were killed. I don't agree with that. I've actually tried to do some assessment on this story of this early on right now. It does appear to be the, the from some of the original reports coming out that there could have been uh, U.S. casualties as a result. Several vehicles were blown up according to uh, the reports coming out of Iraq about this right now, but there is no confirmation that 40 Americans were killed. Speaking about Americans being killed, though, in the situation that happened inside Deir Azort on the eastern side of the river there, they did claim that there were no U.S. coalition forces that were killed in that, according to U.S. official statement on that, uh, and there was no Free Syrian Army, but they were struck by the uh, ISIS, uh, or the, excuse me, by the uh, missiles that were fired by the Russians from the submarines in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, one more thing I'll share, two more things I want to share with you real quick. Uh, Pastor Paul Bagley has just uh, put out a report on a secret deal uh, for peace in Israel. Now, I've shared with you many times, this is something that is a done deal. They just have to do something to kind of show face there. As I brought out the other day, we're dealing with a revived Babylonian empire. So according to uh, Brother Begley here, it, the, 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 it is, they are being totally, it looks like that the leadership of Israel is being left out of this. Jared Kushner involved in the negotiations with the Saudis, etc. But it's just what... Uh, Pastor Paul brings out here that I want to share with you in this statement here. Very interesting. Let me kind of blow it up a little bit uh, and what he says here that just makes me think of things that we have shared with you guys so many times before and I wanted to bring this out to you now. Let's listen, let's listen in real quick here. The, the path to peace between Israel and the Palestinians, it's going to go beyond the current leadership. It, it's going to go beyond... Uh, Palestinian President Maud Abbas, and it's going to go beyond Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, we there's been secret meetings have been go, going on for some time now, as Jared Kirshner has been working the deal. There have been uh, numerous deals with several different leaders within the Middle East, including a secret meeting where the Saudi prince. Mohammed bin Salman actually flew into Jerusalem and met with prominent Jewish leaders, including uh, rabbis and high-ranking officials of the Israeli government. Which now, you catch it on uh, Pastor Begley's channel there, uh, Paul Begley on YouTube there. Uh, let me just bring this out, though, about this. If you remember, one of the things we were sharing with you in, in, the, in the video the other day about our stand with Israel and showing you how there is some very crooked people in the Israeli government from the very beginning, and Ben-Gurion was no different. He was working very much with the Vatican and allowing them to take Jerusalem as an international city uh, and that being controlled by the United Nations. According to uh, the late Barry Chamish and Joel Bainerman, the Vatican will be the one that actually has the ultimate control of Jerusalem and that uh, under Shimon Peres, that was re, uh, re the, the whole plan of making sure that Jerusalem goes under international control was once again moving uh, after it collapsed during after the Six Days War. Remember, Jerusalem was never taken in the War of Independence. The the Jewish, the right-wing Jewish group, the Irgun, they were going to try to take it. Uh, Menachem Begin, our Prime Minister, in the uh, early uh, 1980s, he was a part of that group that wanted to liberate Jerusalem. But they their ship that they brought in, Men Menachem Begin was not on the ship, of course, but that ship with Israelis, Jewish uh, believers that had came in there, I don't, say, I don't mean believers, but Jewish, uh, part of the Jewish community from Europe, they came with the weapons, an entire freighter full of weapons that could have easily taken the old city of Jerusalem and they could have liberated this. But, uh, excuse me, Ben-Gurion and Rabin were involved in giving the orders to sink the ship and kill all these Jews to prevent them from liberating Jerusalem. It's been a stain on the Israeli flag from the very beginning. And of course, now, as we have been watching the, the events that have transpired, 1967 was really a slap in the face for Rome because they were the ones that put, under Pope Pius XII, the order not 
or to, to make Jerusalem an international city. Well, that fell through in 1967 when the Six Days War comes. The Jews finally do take their own old city of Jerusalem. And as we see in the Bible, it says Jerusalem should become a burdensome stone. And it is a burdensome stone to this day for the world. Uh, so Menachem Begin got in, and he was that right winger that they hated because he wanted Jerusalem from the beginning. So this was after the Six Days War. And then I began to notice that they began to woo Menachem Begin as well. Now, instead of the Vatican doing it, they were bringing in the evangelical community to try to get control using the evangelical community and not the true evangelical community, but using false uh, false believers in there to, to try to break the government and to bring about a false leadership in Israel. Now, it seems like maybe the Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu has been holding out somewhat. I can't really say for sure. But as, uh, as uh, Paul Begley was saying here, that they are working this secret deal. They're working it with the Arab leaders around the country in this part of this revived Babylonian empire. So a lot of issues are taking place here. And, you know, it's only a matter of time. They're getting ready. And no doubt we may end up having a war when it comes to this as well. Uh, we're going to be watching closely to see how that happens, how that plays out. And, and the last really little thing I wanted to share with you guys here, uh, another story here. We see these things all the time. Danish woman deported to Tunz, uh, Tun Tunisia for refusing to remove her niqab at a Belgian uh airport. And the niqab, of course, is the head covering that covers the entire face with the exception of the eyes. And that has actually been outlawed in much of the European Union. And here's what's interesting. For the Muslim people that are listening, I got something to share with you on this. I realize now why they have outlawed it. Uh, and it's not what you think it's for. It's not because of freedom of religion, and quite frankly, I think it puts these women into prison, if you ask me. They're prison, prisoner to a man, and they're only allowed to look out a little, little tiny bars there, so to speak. But beside that, you know, if a woman chooses this way, she wants this up to her, in my opinion. But the reason why they outlawed this in the European Union is because their face recognition software cameras can't work if everybody's face is covered up. That's why. They've outlawed it. Maybe some of you guys already figured that one out. But anyway, she was deported because she refused to uncover her face and they could not determine who she was in proper identity. Interesting. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.